Thank you. I appreciate that. And I want to I wanna thank you. For, oh, you have some questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I sure do. Yeah, three quick questions. First, to follow on from the um, chairman's inquiry, you have 1,000 FTEs. How many of those are field people? You talked about field people getting twice a year making inspections. What would you estimate? Those are, those are rail people? inspectors. I, I would I'd hesitate to say how many people, but we have people who are located as remotely as Modoc County. I know, I'm just curious yeah. to see how many are bureaucrats in the inside of San Francisco and how many are out in the field? A lot. Uh, Any idea? Uh, we have 250 people in the safety division, uh, most of them, so I would say out of 250. Most are in the field. Um, over 200 yeah. are in the field, 120 are in the rail um, group, so the 250 includes uh, electricity, gas, and transportation. Okay, thank you. Secondly, if you're long term folks, uh, given any thought to the low oversupply issue with respect to electricity? The, the, the oversupply, oversupply issue. Yeah, the, I, the, the uh, duck curve from the IOU. I, I, mean, I the, know uh, that we're having discussions. The, the electric, the, 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 excuse me, the energy division has actually been looking at it, but a lot of that is, in, is actually a dialogue with our sister agencies. So our role will probably be to help modulate the kind of procurement we do. The actual operators are, the, are going to continue to be the CAISO, so we cooperate with them to see where they think there's specific load constrained issues. Yeah. And then I think uh, it, we look to the CEC to continue to provide forecasts. I do think that as we get into this, it's very important for us to figure out what are the opportunities that come from this rather than just looking at it as a crippling problem. The, the idea that people can actually uh, be a resource, that we can yeah. turn load into a resource, is, is potentially very important. Very uh, well, let me go to the third question, take too much right. time, which really pings off of what you just said, what Senator McGuire had talked about. And I take the inspiration from a very wise man, a guy named Harold Williams, who served as the SEC uh, serves as the chair of the Getty Museum and a very wise guy, and he always had wise, wise gentleman, I should say, not a wise guy. <laughs> and he always and he always asked the question, which I suspect your boss always asks, the governor, and which was really implicit in what Mr. McGuire said, what you said in terms of no policy should stay forever, the notion of nomenclature and trying to understand, and in responding to the last question, why do we even need the PUC anymore? It's, and I'm, I don't say that in, a, in anything other than all of us need to fundamentally re-examine. That's not to say that there are certain protections. You may have to do things differently in a rural area because the changes, are, because the demands are so different. You just said that you're trying to decide the, over, the, 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 the issue concerning the, the oversupply, and we've got such a disbursement of a agencies that makes more sense. Telecom industry is completely different and regulated completely different than it used to be. This was, as the chairman said, a railroad commission. We tend to build these monstrosities, these Winchester mystery houses of government. And it's, it's hard for us when our paycheck is as a result of these entities, but it requires us, if we're going to really be good in government, to step back and say, is my job needed anymore? Do you need five commissioners in San Francisco? The decision to put the PUC in San Francisco was a bunch of political reasons that have a lot of problems for a lot of people. Hearings, access, all of the kinds of development that has occurred. When you say that in the last number of years the rate of change has been extraordinary, it's de minimis compared to the rate of exchange, change that's occurred nationally, internationally, around the state. The challenges that Senator Hill raises. I don't ask you to answer that question, but I think it needs to always be part of what we're about and that the pro challenges that we face that has been raised by every question that's been raised here today is maybe is it time to fundamentally change the ball game? Because it sure seems like that to me. Don't, I don't have an idea about it, and I'm not trying to advocate it. I just think that as a government policy, we should always be willing to ask those questions. Senator, I'd love to have coffee with you and talk about it more. <laughs> it's going to be a long cup of coffee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate you being here today. Well, and I, I personally want to thank you for your uh, willingness to do this job and your commitment to community service. I know this is a very difficult thing, and it's largely a thankless job, but I thank you today for your, for your service. Thank you no, for being thank here. You.
Now I'm going to ask the uh, the Office of the Ratepayer Advocate if you could make your way to the podium. We have uh, Joseph Como, Acting Director of the Office of the Ratepayer Advocates. I think uh, members have questions uh, in your report. Um, maybe you can highlight. Um, uh, maybe uh, briefly some of uh, your accomplishments this year and some of the things that you're working on. Thank you, and Chairman Huizo. We Huizo. have questions, so we'll also uh, have questions for you. Thank you, Chairman Huizo and uh, members. Uh, I'll try not to bore you at this late hour, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it more of a, a, a conversation about ORA and what we are. Um, on my left here is Matthew Marcus. He's uh, my deputy director for, for telecommunications and water. And on my right is Linda Sarazawa, who is the deputy director for energy. Just wanted to basically back up and, and sort of take your lead, Chairman Hueso, on the erosion of public confidence in the PUC and tell you something more about ORA and maybe we can sort of help with, with that conversation. The, the role of, of, the, uh, of ORA is is, is excuse me, fundamentally different than the commission itself. We, we actually exist because we're a voice for the residential customers and for the small commercial customers. We're actually the voice uh, at the PUC for the people who basically get up and go to work every day. We're the, I would say, the most vulnerable group in, in sort of the conversation. We have utilities that have a voice at the PUC. We have large customer groups that have a voice at the PUC. We have uh, the agricultural uh, interests that have a voice at the PUC, but the group that, um, that has the least ability to have a, a voice there is the residential customer. And as, um, uh, as, as Senator McGuire had asked before, we, we actually um, do some of that representation that I hope that, uh, that uh, is useful to his constituents. So we have a statutory mandate, as you know, under 309.5, to advocate for the interests of residential and small commercial customers. We do that with an interest primarily on affordability, safety, and reliability of electric gas and telecommunication services. We significantly um, accomplish that by, by concentrating on some uh, very big issues and a lot of minor issues. I wanna just tell you a little bit about some of the major areas that we work on that we hope help uh, our constituents. And uh, that is primarily through our work on the general rate cases. And some of you already are familiar with that. That is, especially on the electric side, they're the biggest cases where costs are determined for the uh, electric utilities on a, on, on a forward going basis over a, typically a three year uh, forecast. So in those areas, we, we review the accuracy of what utilities are asking for. We challenge and question the utilities justification we do that uh, through discovery, performing audits. We actually develop our own independent forecasts and we produce written extens extensive written testimony to do that with. And we're often the only entity that's doing the entire application. There are many other good groups that are also intervening. Uh, TURN, for instance, and um, uh, other specialty groups which, which add to the, to the voices but ORA has a statutory mandate given to us by the legislature to represent that group of people. And you ask, you may ask, you know, why isn't this the responsibility of the PUC? And I would say that it isn't part of the responsibility of the PUC, but the PUC, as you know, has to respond to a lot of different issues, a lot of different voices. And it's not just the voice of the residential and small commercial customer that they have to hear and understand. It's, it's the voice of all of, the, all of the, the people and all of the groups in California that get services from utilities. And I wanted to tell you basically, very quickly about, a, about a, an example. So I'll just to, to take you through one example of a general rate case that, that ORA did where we were extensively involved in what we did. And back in 2010, the Semper Utilities, that's Southern California Gas and San Diego Gas and Electric, um, they, they filed their application, the general rate case. They asked for a total increase of about a half a billion dollars. And in that uh, work, the ORA thoroughly examined all of their pleadings, all of their 
uh, all of their, their testimony, all of their filings, all their work papers. There were thousands and thousands of pages, as you can imagine, of testimony and work papers. They had lots of proposals. Matter of fact, there were actually thousands of proposals as well. We had to examine each and every one of those. Um, this was uh, undertaken over a 10-month period. We based a factual analysis and our recommendations of our own costs for all of these different areas, including operations, capital investments, uh, things like long-term stock options and incentive payments. And ORI participated in helping to decrease, in this case, SEMPRA's um, request by over 50%. So we basically are an organization that's proactive in this area. We, we invest our time and talents and considerable time and talents to trying to advocate for those big groups of ratepayers, the, the residential and the small commercial customers. We also get input from members of the legislature, from the governor's office. We try to do this obviously within the policy guidelines that you set and the governor's office sets. You know, our, our, our goal basically is to implement the state's policies, but suggest ways to do it in the most cost effective way possible. So um, with that, you know, I want to basically open it up to your questions. Um, wh what ex parte rules do you have? When you uh, meet with PUC commissioners, do you have to disclose the contents of those meetings? Is there a requirement? Um, do, when people meet with you, do you have an ex parte rule? The ex parte rules govern the communication between decision makers and the parties. We are not decision makers. We only can advocate for positions and try to persuade, but we have no authority in that area. We're subject to exactly the same rules as every other party, whether uh, wherever they come from. So the same rules that, that pertain to an outside organization that comes to the commission and acts as a party uh, applies to us exactly in the same way. Okay. So we have to report all of our communications and, um, and we do. We take great efforts to, to communicate properly and to report those communications. And we train our staff to do that as well. Senator Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Como, thank you for the good work you do. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator um, Hill. I have a question about the safety issue that hasn't received much visibility, but is something that first appeared at the end of 2013, when the PUC looked at the pressure of a pipeline that runs through the city of San Carlos in, in the district that I represent. And ORA and pg e have been in dispute over PG&E's interpretation of federal regulation regarding how PG&E is to set the maximum pressure in those, those older pipes, such as the one in, in San Carlos. ORA says that PG&E needs to consider the design pressure for pipe installed prior to 1970. And if PG&E doesn't know the pipe specifications, as it sometimes doesn't, it needs to use conservative assumptions as outlined in the code that we have all seen. PG&E says that as that pipeline, since it was installed prior to 1970 regulations, design pressure is not required and PG&E can just use the pressure obtained through its pressure testing. A pressure test PG&E contends is the gold standard and design pressure is secondary. The federal pipeline regulator has finally weighed in on this subject and says that uh, ORA's interpretation is correct and that PG&E is wrong. The PUC Safety Division, however, has said that the opinion is moot because PG&E never actually eliminated the grandfather clause concerning how to set a maximum pipeline pressure. More than four years after the San Bruno disaster, I would have thought that you know, we would have settled that issue of how to set an appropriate pipeline pressure, but there appears to be more confusion today than ever. What, what I'd like to know is, is this a safety concern? What does ORA think the commission should do about this? And what do you think is the proper venue for the commission to address this issue? Or kind of to phrase it differently, uh, how will we know if the PUC is handling the issue uh, appropriately and responsibly at the end of the day? There's a lot to answer there, <laughs> Senator Hill. Thank you, for, you thank you for the question. Sorry, it's a long one. Um, hey. Let me say, let me ask, answer your, your later question first. Is there a safety issue? We don't see an imminent safety issue here. We see a long-term safety um, consideration here. And what I mean is the, when, as you know, after the San Bruno explosion, the commission had asked the 
the utilities, PG&E, I should say in this case, mm -hmm. to pressure test all of their pipes. And they did that, to my knowledge, they've, they've done that. And I can say that there, that there is not an imminent safety issue because the pipes as they exist today seem to be operating safely with regard to pressure tests that were performed. Now, that is not the only thing that governs safety in a pipeline. We took issue with, as you know, PG&E over, over the standard for uh, the maximum uh, operating pressure mm -hmm. that uh, should be employed to operate the pipeline. Uh, I think that was line 147 you're referring to. Mm -hmm. We were, in fact, confused by PG&E's uh, statements regarding their operation of the pipeline and guidance from the PUC in this area. So we, as you know, we asked PHMSA, the Federal uh, Health and uh, Hazardous Materials Safety Administration to opine on whether uh, PG&E was in fact, uh, or I should say under this hypothetical, whether they uh, needed to uh, operate under a different part of the regulations than they claimed to be. And they did agree with us. Now, so the backup now to answer a broad question. The pipeline safety rules as they exist were developed in the 1950s. They required the pipeline operators to operate their pipes based on a set of criteria. So now one set of criteria was that you, you, can, you can basically take the, the pipeline design and three other parameters and you can test your pipeline across those, those four parameters. One is what the pipes can, uh, what's, what it's designed from, you know, what are the components? And you had to operate uh, the pipeline with the, at the lowest pressure that was dictated by the, one of those four, okay? The other way you could operate the pipeline is if you had that pipeline in operation prior to 1970, you could operate it under the, what's called the exemption portion of it. Right. Some people call it the grandfather clause, grandfather clause, but basically it's an, ex an exception to the rules. And what it does is it allows you to operate the pressure at a, at a pressure that you historically operated it in the five years prior to 1970. Now, the problem here is that you have to have operating records and maintenance records for the pipeline during that period of time. As you know, records were missing for much of mm -hmm. these operating years. So um, we took issue with the fact that PG&E did not have the records to operate the uh, pipeline under the grandfather clause, all right, and they were not complying with the new, the, the, the basic standard pipeline uh, parameters which required you to have information on the design of the pipe, which goes back to the record keeping problem, we don't have the records. So um, they didn't, com they weren't complying with the exception and they weren't complying with the standard rules. So we asked FIMSA to confirm that, and as you stated, they did confirm it. So at this point, you know, uh, and I should also add to that that um, a, a senior um, executive at PG&E stated on the, on the witness stand just a few weeks ago that they are not using the grandfather clause. Mm. So basically they are neither fish nor fowl. We don't know what they're operating their pipelines under right now. We've asked the commission to clarify their own orders and their own rules in this area. And we've asked them to establish a path where PG&E and the other utilities would come into com compliance with the federal rules, which we don't believe they are in compliance with. So it, we don't see it as an imminent safety threat, but basically they have to establish the path for them okay. to come into compliance in the future. Very good, thank you. Appreciate that answer. Yes. Not the right, not, not, not one I wanted to hear, but. You mentioned that you have the ability to do research and to uh, delve into the bookkeeping of the IOUs. And uh, you might not have that same authority over the MOUs. But the, the, the questions I want to ask is, uh, when you're, what are you looking for when you're looking for um, uh, what, what benefits rate payers? Uh, MOUs uh, aren't profit motivated, they're service oriented. Uh, while the IOUs are guaranteed a profit, whether it's 11 or 12, I forget the specific rate, but we work in a profit to the system. And it's very interesting that we do that without really having any requirements on comparing things apples to apples with regards to the delivery of services and, and the costs in doing that. So if uh, generally if a CEO of a MOU gets paid, you know, 
200,000 a year does a CEO of an IOU get paid 200,000 a year? Is that an accurate measurement? Do, you, do, we, do we ever look at what is required to deliver safe and uh, affordable services with regards to the cost of providing that? Uh, do you ever look at that as something that, are, are you, are you uh, equipped to do that? Is it within your mission to do that? Uh, can you? I would say that there are a lot of areas that we actually look at. When we, when we examine the books and records of utility, it is for the purpose of supporting the, our, our, our case and the general rate case. General rate cases are forward-looking um, financial instruments where a utility basically develops what they believe is going to, are going to be their costs over the next several years. And we look at their books and records to support our analysis and our own forecast of their costs and records. So we will look at records and how they spent their money um, in areas since the last rate case, for instance, which is typically three years prior. And we, and we see where the spending trends are and where the tr spending trends are going. And if, they, if we see spikes in spending, we will question whether, why there's a spike in the spending area or we will examine whether we believe they've been spending the money in the areas that they should have been spending it on just from the last rate case. In, 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 in comparing their services, uh, you're right, they are profit-oriented uh, companies and we also um, spend a great deal of our time arguing what that level of profit should be and we do that by comparing it to the financial records of, of um, hundreds of companies across the United States, which are also um, uh, investor-owned utilities. In terms of sort of a more granular look, we also conduct a um, financial analysis of what executives are supposed to get paid at these utilities. Um, I don't know of any utilities that get paid as little as $200,000, but I, I, I appreciate your, uh, your, 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 your plug there for the, My for the proper level, I, will t I would say. <laughs> but uh, we often, um, you know, we do these studies and, we, and we, we argue our cases at the commission in terms of uh, things like executive bonuses and whatnot. And, and um, you know, we do the best we can. We, 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 we try to convince the, the commission that a certain level of funding is appropriate, but but we don't always succeed. Sometimes, to our to our amazement, we, for instance, recently, uh, which utility was it that went from 50% to 90%? That was okay. That was a PG&E. So the commission approved executive um, the ratepayers paying for the executive bonuses of the um, highest paid people at PG&E. It used to be that PG&E was getting about 50% of their executive bonuses from ratepayers uh, during the last rate case they went up to 90 percent from ratepayers um, over our objections so so you have found irregularities or things that you feel are not good for ratepayers that have not been acted on I would say that there because is because your the, advisory you say this is not good and well, your your advice can be ignored our advice can be ignored because we're we're an advocate, we're a party. You know, they, they do have. I just want to distinguish between the, the advisory people at the commission, the people who actually are on staff that work for the for the commissioners. They can they can take our information and advise them on whether they think it's appropriate to listen to our advice, for instance. But we, um, you know, we represent that one voice that I, that I talked about, mm -hmm. and whether we get listened to or not is, you know, a matter of record. But um, we do have meetings with the commissioners, and we do a, which are all reported. We do have we we, we do outreach to the to the um, to the public. We try we participate in public participation hearings, in town hall meetings. We talk to members. Did you send sixty five thousand emails to the PUC? Did we did we send them? <laughs> no, I don't think so. And you can look at all those sixty five thousand, and you won't see any emails with uh, my name as being a. A, a I, I suggest forth. you get to work. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I say one thing? Sure. Um, it, I don't know if this is on. It's on. We, when we notice things in the process of um, uh, reviewing GRC applications, general rate case applications, if we see that there might have been a violation of the laws or rules, we will bring those issues to the advisory staff of the commission. So. Okay. Anything else? Any closing remarks? 
I just want to thank you for your guidance. Um, I, I, I believe that under um, President Picker, I have high hopes for the commission in terms of transparency, and and uh, I think we should give him a chance to to see what he can do with the organization. And and um, there are, I just want to tell you, there are a lot of good people at the, at the PUC. Um, there are you know close to a thousand people there, and and I would say that it is a. Uh, by far a staff that is very devoted to the public interest. Thank you. Those are nice closing remarks. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very encouraged by your remarks and those of uh, Commissioner Pickard. I think this is a good way to initiate the year in the spirit of working on these issues. These are good issues to work on this year, and hopefully we'll, we'll keep an eye on, on the progress in the ensuing years. Uh, should uh, we be fortunate enough to be here. So thank you again for your service to, your, to our community. Thank you all for, for what you're doing. I want to thank uh, all our staff here today uh, for, uh, for uh, their, their preparation in this committee, uh, for, for Jay uh, Dickinson, Nidia Bautista, Malini Gutierrez, and uh, Kerry Ishida. Kerry, Kerry Ishida? Thank you. Thank you for, for hanging in with us in this long meeting. So we'll wrap it up today and we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.